Hey guys, welcome to Digital Srini channel on YouTube. And if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please go ahead and do that right now. Well, in this video, I'm going to talk about embedding layers in deep learning, and I'm going to use Keras to demonstrate the use of embedding layer. And if you already know this, that's probably because you have worked in the field of natural language processing, because one of the primary applications of embedding layers are in word encoding, and obviously that falls into the natural language processing part of deep learning. Now, you can... Uh, you can find these embedding layers in other fields, for example, in generative adversarial network, especially the conditional generative adversarial networks. This is where you'll uh, find embedding layers and there are other applications. But let's understand what these are. And as usual, I'll go through a couple of slides initially and then let's jump into the code to run a couple of lines of code to get a better understanding of this. OK, so going to the next slide, first of all, when you search for this on Google, you will run into the Keras page. And I definitely uh, recommend you to look at the original documentation, no matter what you're looking at, right? Whether it is embedding layers or something else. Well, if you look at the documentation, it tells you exactly what the input parameters are and everything. But down here, it gives a quick summary. What does it mean? Turns positive integers into dense vectors of fixed size. In case you don't know what dense vectors mean, uh, basically it means most of the values in the vectors are non-zero. Sparse vectors is the opposite of dense vectors, which means most information is uh, contained in a small amount of uh, uh, data. Sparse vectors uh, are the ones where you have a lot of zeros and occasionally you have ones or some other data. So this is a dense vector, which means uh, most of the values in the vector are non-zero. So that's what that summary means. It turns the positive integers into dense vectors. Now let's get a bit of more understanding. So what is the embedding layer? Well, it maps each value in the input array. I'll show you a quick example, but just to slowly get there, it maps each value in the input array to a vector of a defined size. What does that mean? Well, uh, we'll see that in a second. This other statement I want to make before moving on is that the weights in this layer are learned during the training process. Okay, you can assign a manual vector. For example, if you have a, a vector of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, an array of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it can be mapped to a vector where each value here, like 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4, right? Each of these can be represented by a vector by itself, a vector of size 50, for example. And how do you fill those values in that vector? This is what we mean here. The weights in this layer are learned during the training process. You can assign all ones. You can assign all zeros. But normally, you assign a uh, random distribution of numbers, and then you train them as part of the training process. That's the whole point of ha having an embedding layer. And the initialization is performed just like any other Keras layers. Like I just mentioned, you can do ones, you can do zeros. But obviously, how do we initialize any Keras layer? We usually use hey normal or uniform and so on. OK, now let's get to the next level of understanding. Why use these embedding layers if you can use integer or one-hot encoding, right? Uh, as you probably know, uh, for categorical cross entropy based models, classification models, we convert our classes into one hot encoding. For example, if you look at C410 dataset, yeah, you have all these uh, different uh, types of images. And then when you try to put together a classification algorithm, you are, uh, you are converting your inputs, right? I mean, you're basically the labels, input labels into one hot uh, en uh, encoded values. What does that mean? Well, you probably know what one hot encoding is. So if you have a sentence called, hello, how are you doing? So you can encode this as hello as having one zero 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 because one hot encoded, only one value can be one if you just look at each row. So hello is basically one four zeros. How is zero one zero 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 and so on. This is our one hot encoding. You can also do integer encoding, which is instead of uh, a one hot encoding, you can say my hello has a value of zero or represented by a label of zero. How is one, two, three, four, and so on. If you have another uh, word like in your dictionary, then that can be uh, that can be in a word number five and so on. So you can do integer encoding or one hot encoding. In fact, this is what we do. Like we have done integer encoding when we did random forest or uh, support vector machines or any of the traditional machine learning, we have been using integer encoding. For deep learning, for multi-class, we have been using one-hot encoding. So why introduce another embedding layer? Well, 
Let's see why. One hard encoding is inefficient because this is a sparse representation. Remember I just mentioned dense representation, dense vector, sparse vector. This is a sparse vector because think of how many zeros you have just to represent hello. Now your dictionary, your word, your corpus has 1000 different words in your you know, natural language processing. Just imagine how many zeros you have. You have 1000 ones Everything else is zeros in your entire matrix. So that's not an efficient way of assigning this, especially when you're dealing with something like uh, 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 text processing. If you have only 10 classes, fine, that works. Now, integer encoding, why is that not great? Because integer encoding does not reflect the relationship between the words, yeah? So uh, when you say R, the word R, maybe oftentimes it comes in between how and you. How are you doing? How are you feeling, right? Uh, or what are you doing? And it also can be associated with uh, R is associated with you in this context and can also be associated with how and what and why and so on. These associations are completely gone if you just do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then there is no context, but you need the context in uh, natural language processing, right? So that's exactly what embedding allows. It allows for the representation of similar words using similar encoding, with similar encoding. And how does that know the similar encoding? This is where the learning process helps. You're training it. You're training uh, uh, the, the network based on a whole bunch of examples. And based on that, these values are learned. And hence, it learns the context. So this is why embedding is commonly used in natural language processing. Now, where are these embedding layers used? I already mentioned text processing, right? So if you heard the term word to vector, you're converting a word into a vector, right? So in natural language processing, just to give you a quick example, let's go back to the same example I just mentioned. Hello, how are you doing? Now you assign words, uh, sorry, uh, integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you have another sentence, hello, how are you feeling? Now, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, and this is our 5, right? The fifth new word in our dictionary. So in total, if this is all I have, I have six words. Hello, how are you doing and feeling, right? So I have six words in this entire uh, uh, dictionary of mine or corpus of mine. So here we have six words in our entire vocabulary. Now I want to embed these or represent this, sorry, uh, using a vectors of size 2. Okay, that's it. Let's just keep things simple. Each of this, each of these six words, I want to represent with a vector of size two. And let's say our sentence has uh, a size of five, right? Here, are, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So this is the size of our sentence. So how do you write this? Well, it's pretty easy. When you define your model in a sequential way, all you got to do is model.add embedding. And six is this, uh, our size of our vocabulary and two, is the size of our vector and you can choose that to be 10 20 50 right so that is the size of our vector and you don't have to provide embedding initializer deliberately i'm just showing you so you know exactly what's happening if you don't provide this keras automatically assigns the default initializer which i believe is hey normal or hey uniform one of those two but then it's still a random uh, initializer and not ones or zeros. And our input length in this case, my sentence size is five and my input length equals to five. So this is how I would define an embedding layer as part of our text processing. The, another example I gave you is a generative adversarial networks. In fact, in the upcoming tutorials, I am going to focus on generative adversarial networks, at least a few of those. So that's the reason why I'm talking about embedding layers, because I want you guys to understand exactly what's happening when you add that layer as part of our model. So uh, conditional uh, generative adversarial networks. Why conditional? Because we want to generate images of a specific class. If it is conditional, then you can actually generate images with specific attributes. You want, uh, for example, CIFAR 10 dataset, and you want uh, uh, to generate all frogs, <laughs> okay? I believe frog is part of CIFAR 10 uh, class or deer. So you want to generate all deer images only. Otherwise, it's going to be random, right? I mean, we don't know uh, how uh, this input vector is going to behave. So we condition this generative adversarial networks using uh, by training the class. So when you do that, if you have 10 classes, you need 10 different representations of this uh, 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 of these classes. So that's exactly what we do. We are going to use embedding layer as the first layer to represent each class as a vector, and then we train it. 
So when we provide this as input, we can actually condition our generative adversarial network. So example, I just mentioned CIFAR 10 has 10 classes. And we want these 10 classes to be represented by vectors that can be trained and a vector of size what? So let's say our vector has a size of 50. Okay, again, I, I, it can be size of 20. Uh, let's say it, uh, the vector has a size of 50. So the way you add this layer is model.add embedding. Our size is 10 here, 10 classes. 50 is the size of the vector. And this is optional parameter. You can provide that embedding initializer is uniform. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If not, uh, our exercise probably fills any gaps that you have in your knowledge right now. So let's jump into our spider IDE. It doesn't matter. You can jump onto Google Colab if you want, but let's go ahead and write a few lines of code or go through a few lines of code to get a better understanding of this. Okay, so here is our code. I am going to share this with you, so please pay uh, attention and I, I think I have uh, uh, done a decent job in adding enough, uh, enough text here so it makes sense for you when you're going uh, through the code yourself. So first of all, uh, NumPy, I'm just importing NumPy because obviously I want to create a, uh, uh, an array down here and I'm using the sequential method from our keras.models so I can create a small model uh, uh, for this experiment. And more importantly, from keras.layers, remember from keras.layers, we get convolutional layers, we get dense layers and batch normalization, all of these, one of those is embedding. Okay, so we're going to import our embedding. And I'm also importing TensorFlow STF, no idea why, because obviously I'm not using it, but for now, let's leave that. So let's run these lines. Okay, so there you go. And now let's go ahead and create a small model. And starting with, of course, sequential, right? And then we go ahead and add the layers to when you do sequential method. So first let's go ahead and define our model as sequential. And now we are going to define our embedding layer of size 10. Yeah, because our, let's say if we are dealing with CIFAR 10 data set or even MNIST data set, right? You have 10 classes. So you have 10 right there. And then let's define our vector to have a size 50. And our embedding initializer, I'm going to initialize with all ones so it keeps things simple. We will only see all ones in this vector, but at least it gives us an idea uh, uh, to begin with. And then we can change that later on. So that's our model. So let's go ahead and add that. And now let's define our input array as a NumPy array of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This is, this is basically our CIFAR 10, for example, or even MNIST. So when we run this, this is my input array of size what? Of size 10, that's it or 10 by one, if you want to call that, that's the size of 10 input array. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm stressing on this fact because if your input array is 10 or 10 by one, then your output here is going to be 10 by one by 50, because we want each of these 10 uh, individual elements or integers to be represented with a vector of size 50. That's exactly what's going to happen. So now I'm going to do model.predict on my input array. This is basically my output, right? So let's go ahead and look at the output right there. And if you look up here, my output array has a size of 10 by one by 50. And if I open this, you see this is my zeroth. So let's go ahead and change the axis to the first axis all once. Okay, right there, all 50 of them. Oh, that thing, yeah, all 50 of them and you have 10 right there. So for each of these, it's all once and normally, you do not initialize by one, right? So you initialize by some random number, so you would see all random numbers right there. So this is exactly what uh, embedding layer does. So now just to uh, for the fun of it, let's define our array as an array. I'm just expanding the dimensions along the zeroth axis. That means it's going to be, instead of 10, the array input array is going to have a size one by 10. So the output right now will be one by 10 by 50. So output array, let's go ahead and do this. And you can see here, my output array two is one by 10 by 50. Again, all ones right now, it doesn't matter. You see, all ones. Okay, now that you understand the basic of what's going on, now let's go ahead and uh, create one for, for our uh, word example. Let's say again, say going back to hello, how are you doing? Zero, one, two, three, four. Hello, how are you feeling? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So total, we have six words. In, in our vocabulary. So that means let's go ahead and create an embedding for these six words. Each embedding vector of size two 
And I'm going to initialize using some random uniform initialization. And I'm going to provide my input length equals to five because our sentence size equals to five. So let's run these two. Let's create, clean up everything else. And let's run these lines one more time, the library and these two. Oh, we need to create our model there. Oh, sorry. Wrong, wrong, wrong location. Okay, there you go. So we need to create our model C equal to sequential and then our embedding 6, 2. We just went through that. And now let's provide our input array as a array of 1 by 6, right? The array of 1 by 6 has value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is so far we know that. This is nothing but our integer encoded right there. So now let's go ahead and predict this or uh, look at the output and this is this must be of size 1 by 6 by 2 up there you can see this is size 1 by 6 by 2 if I open this now you can see that each of my words like this is the word how hello this is how this is are you doing and this is feeling each of this is represented by a vector of size 2 and you can see how these are kind of random numbers right there Okay, so hopefully, again, that uh, makes uh, sense to you. And finally, let's clean things up one final time and show you how uh, one more example. And let's end this uh, video. So here I am, uh, again, providing a generative adversarial network type of example where you have 10 of these, which is exactly what we have done earlier up here, uh, except I'm changing my... Uh, embedding initializer from uh, once to uniform that's the only thing and you probably would add compile equals to rms prop or msc or something so i just added these three let's go ahead and create our model and then my input array of course is going to be 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 this is this is my integer encoded and my output is uh, after the prediction so let's go ahead and predict the output and you probably can guess how the output is going to look like it should be 10 by 1 by 50 yeah so let's go ahead and there you go it's 10 by 1 by 50 and if I go here you can see for each of these classes it's represented by a vector of size 50 and all of these numbers these are just initial numbers by the way remember this entire thing is trained as you go through your neural network training so at the end of the training you'll have the final word embeddings right there okay uh, so i i seriously hope you understood this because this can be very useful like i said if you want to get into natural language processing or if you want to understand this conditional uh, generative adversarial networks where we are conditioning using uh using our uh, input vectors like this okay so thank you guys and again i hope you found this to be uh, useful and please hit the like button if you really want me to uh, talk about uh, generative adversarial networks at least uh, a couple of conditional generative adversarial networks i don't know convert horses to zebras or generate realistic looking microscope images if you really like me to do that go ahead and hit the like button for this video that's one way of communicating of course leaving your comments is also a, uh, a good way of communicating with me thank you and let's meet again in the next video